everyone, welcome to Curious Rebel TV. My name is Advita Patel and I am the founder of Comms Rebel, uh, if you just didn't know. So Comms Rebel is um, an organisation that helps to build inclusive, uh, inclusive cultures through effective communications uh, with various global organisations across the, across the world. And I'm delighted to be here with Leslie Woods today. And when we shared that Leslie was going to be on Curious Rebel TV, we had a barrage of uh, DMs and comments of, of people being quite excited to hear from you today, Leslie. So no pressure, no pressure at all today. Uh, so Leslie has a background in public relations and has 20 years of experience curating and creating compelling stories. And I'm gonna let Leslie introduce herself about the role that she plays and, and how she got involved in communications. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I like to think of myself as an organizational storyteller. Um, so I'm actually third generation women in my family that have served in the, in the military, in the UK armed forces, in the army and the air force. Um, and so I've always kind of been sort of drawn to that kind of sort of the military side, what's happening going out and traveling the world. I love to travel. Um, but I think my first, my mother says my first word was why. So <laughs> I was always kind of like, hmm, why, hmm, why, what's your story? Why did that happen? And so that kind of sort of just that innate curiosity just sort of led me into the whole, um, you know, sharing stories, finding out the power of stories. Cause you don't know as, as a kid growing up, you don't know this is going to be your career per se. Um, I, I was always kind of sort of following in. My my gran was um, an ambulance driver in World War Two. That's how she met my granddad in the army. Um, and then my my mother was the poster girl for the 1960s Women's Royal Air Force, and that's how she met my dad. Um, and so I, here I am today, third generation. Um, so oh, what an amazing history and story that is! So you have you so you've always had the pull to be working in the kind of Royal Air Force, and I take it so it's it's been part of your DNA and blood. Uh, for forever, right? It it has. I mean, there's. Um, if you go back to the family photo album, I found pictures of me, very very small, wearing like you know, mum and dad sort of like you know, headgear and bits of uniform. And then as soon as my little brother was born, five years after me, I had someone to boss around and be in charge of. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was issuing orders from a very early age. You know? I love that. I love that. So you've had such an interesting career path. Uh, you know, working for someone like, you know, like Royal Air Force, I can imagine you've, been, you know, you, you've had lots of different stories that you've had to tell. There is something about um, storytelling, isn't there? Like you, you kind of, you kind of touched on that just a second ago about how stories can really empower and inspire and help others thrive in, in what they're doing and, and also help people understand sometimes very complex things that are going on. And from my perspective, inclusive storytelling is quite a, it is an important part of what we do. So how do we build stories that are quite inclusive? You know, what do we do to make sure that we're being as, we're taking on board the different audiences and different publics and different colleagues that we're talking to on a, on a frequent basis? And I can imagine in the military that you have so many different types of stakeholders that you have to engage in, in some of the work that you're doing. So have you got any, you know, what have you got any kind of top tips or uh, recommendations, advice for some of the folks who are listening on how you can build this kind of inclusive storytelling space that sometimes we can struggle with? Because, you know, day to day, we're just like overwhelmed out with so much noise. So how do we cut through that noise in this kind of inclusive storytelling way? So there's um, a quote from the author Brené Brown that I love in her book called Atlas of the Heart, where she talks about having the courage to walk alongside somebody. So I then kind of added my own sort of storytelling layer on that as having the courage to walk alongside somebody and not make it about me or about anybody else, about them. So having the courage to walk alongside somebody and share their story and reflect it back to target audiences in a way that is authentic to that person. So basically, I'm, I'm effectively the vessel. It's never about me, although obviously I do put the uniform on and run around the world and have to serve in the same places that my colleagues do but I'm here to share their stories. I am the yeah. story, but I am not the story. That's the way I look yeah. at it. And the secret, the secret of my success that I've kind of put together over the years is to show up in the service of others and let go of the outcome. Because if you show up with innate curiosity and just kind of keep an open mind and just listen and chat and perhaps ask a few questions just to tease out the real story, if someone's a bit shy or a bit, a bit less forthcoming, and then take it from there. But let go of the outcome because, again, 
if you rock up to tell a story with a fixed mindset, it never plays well. I've literally had some things backfire on me in that, <laughs> that have that open mindset that doesn't work. Yeah. I love that. So it's it's you know, don't don't focus too much on the outcome, right? So be very curious with the person that you're telling the story about, you know, without making assumptions about them and their characteristic or you know we do that as human beings don't we because the life that we may have grown up in or the environment that we may have been or even you know the societal challenges that we have and if you think about the work the world right now in social media and what we're fed you know some of the kind of biases that we're often fed about certain groups or certain individuals before we go into that storytelling mode we do make assumptions about people Mm -hmm. You know, we do think, oh, they're definitely going to be like this because I've heard that they... I remember when I uh, I used to work in an organisation and there was this uh, leader who was apparently notorious for being uh, disconnected with comms and didn't really want anything to do with comms and wasn't interested in comms. And every kind of person I met kept saying to me, oh, you're not going to get much from them. Like, don't even bother. They're really disconnected. They're not interested. And a part of me was like, well, there must be a reason there has to be a reason why they are not interested in what we're doing or interested in sharing their story. Is it their personality? Is it something else? And to be honest, luckily at that point, I was really interested in bias and how does bias show up and how do we form our opinions? And we're going to talk a little bit about traitors. I don't know how much you can, you can talk about this, but we, we are going to talk about that a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> just a tiny bit, because it, it, it demonstrates what I'm going to say is that, you know, it's amazing how our minds work when somebody else tells us something and it only has to be one thing that that kind of sets in our heads and then we kind of make assumptions and our behavior is so different when we're interviewing somebody when we have this bias about them so because I was doing this bias work at that time I did step into that conversation with completely fresh pair of eyes so I didn't know like I just ignored all the information that was shared with me Mm. about their character and their personality and went in just like I didn't know who they were and we had such a fulfilling conversation because to your point, I just listened. You know, I asked curious questions. I wanted to understand what, what what were the barriers were, what the blockers were, what they didn't want to do and what they did want to do and help them kind of shape their narrative, right? And they got it. They understood the power of comms. But yeah. previously, people went in with some, like, a, a bit dictatory about we're going to get you to do this and we're going to get you to do this and this is what we need you to write. And they disliked that. And, and just listening to what they were saying, we formed a really great relationship. But... Talking about that, the traitors, right? So I'd, I'm, I'm a bit worried because I don't want to give the game away too much, but because some people may not watch it, I don't want to do spoilers. But there is, um, we won't talk about the kind of the, the winner thing. But in, the, yeah. it's safe to say that somebody in traitors was is, was part of your world, right? Because that's quite that's an open thing. So um, actually, two of them, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two, right? Two of them saving officer. Uh, one was uh, not saving anyone, but one was a saving officer. How how interesting did you find that show in terms of how, because we spoke about this in our pre-chat, didn't we, about um, how you have to sometimes disconnect from the emotion side of things um, when the work that you you folks do within the army or, or you know, within within the armed forces. How, how did that play out for you, that kind of show, that disconnection, but being emotive? How does that work for you as well as a comms person within this, the, the Royal um, Navy? It's well in it, yeah. So this this is where I think um, the juxtaposition is really really interesting. In the in the military, as you've said, you follow orders. You you give really clear briefings because you have to. People's lives are on the line. You have to do exactly what you're told. You follow orders. When you're in the media, it's like hmm, storytelling. Oh, we could do the story this way. We could do the story that way. And so when I come in and you're wearing uniform, people go, okay. So she's a senior officer in uniform. She's going to tell me exactly what to do. And I'm going to do that and it's going to be fine. And it's going to look awful on telly and it's going to sound inauthentic on radio and it's going to read terribly in print because you're not being you. You're being the military version of what you think the communications officer wants you to do. So I'm wearing the outfit of one job and having the mindset of a completely different job, which is why I love. I mean, the air crew in the RAF will tell you they have the best job. I think I have the best job. It's so varied. I've literally been around the world and worked with almost every single trade and branch. And I think. To go back to your point of being emotionally detached, to be a good comms officer, you need to be emotionally engaging. So Mm -hmm. if I'm going to help you tell your story, you need to trust me, right? I need to trust me quickly. So the idea is I have to be emotionally engaging to you as the person I'm trying to help share your story with. So I need to emotionally engage you quickly in a way that you trust me to tell your story. 
what the I mean, I won't name him, but the person that won traitors, <laughs> yeah, yeah, said in a lot of his media interviews that one of the things that helped him actually there were two things that helped him win. One of the things that helped him win was the ability to emotionally detach, and that's where I mean the second part of my sum for success of letting go of the outcome. So to being able to emotionally detach from what's happening. And the second part of success, go and getting a good night's sleep and not, not ruminating about it, um, is what makes you good in the military because you might be going through all kinds of things in a place like Afghanistan or other operations around the world. And you have to be able to park it and let go of it and not attach too much of yourself to it. Yeah. Otherwise, you just wouldn't get the job done. But my job's a comms officer. I need those emotions. So it, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's always an electric fence. Which side shall I go on? Yeah, and and you know that applies to comms in general, right? About we we have to be we have to be able to tell a story with with as much with limited bias as possible, right? In 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 what we're doing because we we have to uh, you know we will have feelings, we'll have emotions, and we'll have our thoughts about what's happening. But we do have to to an to an extent, in some extent, is detach ourselves so we're telling the story fairly. I suppose that's where when I talk to some um, colleagues and peers and other comms professionals, it's really difficult in subjects that are quite emotive. Um, you know, so if we talk about, you know, the world that I'm in, which is equity, diversity and inclusion, it's about human humans, right? And human human beings and how we work with them and how we tell that story and, and what that means and what that looks like. Do you have any, and, and you do this on a daily basis, Leslie, so do you have any advice on any comms managers or comms leaders who are finding it difficult to, you know, not not detach themselves in that way, but to be kind of like not get emotionally involved, um, and and in, in in and maybe cause challenge in how they tell that story, right? From what point of view? So, how any top tips or advice on how we may manage that as a person who may be dealing with some difficult circumstances, but they need to get that story out in in a a way that's not peppered in bias and i think you have to find and it's difficult it's difficult for all of us and it's individual to all of us you yeah. have to balance that's right for you because if you go too far the other way you lose your own authenticity you you know yeah. you become as, as the storyteller and therefore anything that you help convey will also have that that inauthenticity to it as well so there is a balance i mean there's a very brief story where i i've never cried I've never cried in almost 20 odd years of doing the job until last year. Um, and so I was working with the British Armed Forces and doing our training of Ukrainian Armed Forces here in the UK. They come to us for a few weeks and they get basic training and they go back with some kit back to their homeland to fight. And I was telling the story um, of a Ukrainian chap who'd come over. His family had been evacuated to the UK and he hadn't seen them for over a year and they were reunited, which is all very emotional. And I was telling his story to national media through a Ukrainian um, interpreter. And she was this lovely lady who'd been an air hostess before the war. And she was now with perfect English, stood beside me just off camera, translating everything into English for us to give it to the British media. And this guy that was telling his story was very stoic and oh, I'm a hero and here's my family. And I, bit, and I could feel her just sort of shaking beside me. And she had tears sil silently streaming down her face because she, she turned to me in English, even live on telly and said, I miss my family. And I looked at her and I started having tears coming down my eyes. I'm, I'm going now, actually. And I, I just reached out and I took her hand. We were both off camera and it wasn't about us. It wasn't mm. about our story, but it, it moved her so much. She was the storyteller, not me. I was secondly removed. She yeah. was the storyteller and she'd lost it in the emotional heat of the moment. Um, and then what happened was that the, the wife of this chap also started crying. So I literally had a woman on each hand, both Ukrainian. Oh. And we didn't we didn't share a lot of language, but they just held my hands for what felt like the longest five minutes while that TV interview finished. And I went mm -hmm. back to my my British Army and Air Force colleagues and they just said, um, you're right there, Leslie, you've got a bit of dusty eye syndrome, we call it in the military. <laughs> Like oh, I've got some dust in my eye on the airfield. I'm not crying. You're crying. You know. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Only time I've cried in twenty odd years. And then I came um, home about it, and I was like, I'm not ashamed because actually I was channeling. I was channeling the emotions of the people that I was protecting and looking after that day. Yeah. But it, you know, even even doing it twenty years, I don't always get it right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know, and I think you know what, Leslie. Though I don't even think it's about getting it right or getting it wrong. Right. Like we. 
I think comms often get a rough ride in all of this. Like, you know, we are meant to be like, you know, like I just said, like we're meant to be telling stories without too much emotion involved or too much bias involved and being quite stoic in how we share that. And there is sometimes this kind of shame or defensiveness in, in some of the work that we can often do. Because we, you know, we 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 are empathetic, I think, as human, like generally, you know, I am stereotyping here a little bit, but the comms people that I generally connect with are empathetic because we wouldn't do what we do. You know, we are storytellers. We enjoy conversing with individuals and and you know making sure that they are heard and, and they're doing the right thing but there is there is something in you know sometimes we do get a bit of a, a rough ride of it all in terms of like you should be like this and it should be like this and you need to be doing this and you and I both know and I'm sure folks who are listening will know that everybody thinks they can do comms you know, everybody's yeah. an expert everybody has an opinion everybody thinks we should be doing this way we should be in that way and we try our best don't we to kind of keep those wheels turning to make sure that we're sharing those stories effectively and efficiently and making sure we're doing justice for that person that we're sharing that story about internally and, and externally, right? But so I don't think there is a right or wrong. And Brené Brown that you mentioned mm. previously, you know, she is she is someone that I admire a lot because she talks so openly about vulnerability, you know, how vulnerable that, you know, there's nothing wrong with being vulnerable. There's nothing wrong with putting ourselves out there and saying, actually, I'm very uncomfortable with this. However, this is this is how we, you know, this is my advice that I would give you because we still have a job to do, don't we, at the end of the day of all this. But, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And the fact that, you know, I'm not, I'm a bit like you. I'm not, I, I'm not a, you know, I don't get Justin Myers very often as <laughs> well, what I'll say. But um, there are moments where it does get in your throat, right? When you see the actual emotion and you realise the importance of some of the work that we do and how yeah. how it's so meaningful to so many of the people that we speak with, which is why I'm so passionate about inclusion and so passionate that we make sure that it's not just one person's and one, pers one type of person's story that we are sharing. You know, we're allowing people, those voices to be heard everywhere. Uh, and we play a big part in this, which is why I always talk about comms and how comms can make sure that we're being fair and equitable yeah. in the way we tell our stories about our workforce or the stakeholders that we are managing. And on that, you know, if you, we're in a world, aren't we, where people do put us in boxes. Yeah. And they do put these labels on us and, you know, you're this. And I was saying to somebody just before I came on here, actually, that I was often asked to join like the race group, you know, in the workplace. Mm. Uh, and then the women's group as well, because I'm a woman and I'm a woman of colour. And I always used to kind of joke and say, well, who do you want me to show up as today? Do you want me to show up as a, a brown person being discriminated against? So am I being showing up as a woman who's been discriminated you know, like, The intersectionality of who we are is sometimes under, under, uh, well, underrepresented, but also uh, not focused on as much as we, we should be. And I'm assuming that when people hear about you and the work that you do in the Royal Air Force uh, as a media officer there, that there's you've probably been tagged labeled I should say yourself yeah what what do you you know how do you think we can break free from this label because we just spoke about humanness we just spoke about connections how we're all different what are your kind of what's your advice on this labels that we sometimes attach to ourselves and oh we shouldn't be crying or we shouldn't show this emotion because we're doing this what what how do you see that kind of playing out in the future like not having these labels or are they important should we have labels like is it a bad thing I think, like you said earlier, there's no right or wrong. I think one thing I would would advise, and it took me it took me the death of my father to realise this one, is you need to be aware of the labels you're carrying, because some of them you might have chosen for yourself. Like you might choose to be, I'm going to be a brown lady today, and I'm proud of that, and I want to do that. That's your choice to wear that label on that day. But there'll be labels that we carry that others have given us that perhaps we're unaware of, and we're feeling a bit weighed down and a bit meh. And actually, when my father died, he was a wing commander in the Royal Air Force. He was very, very proud that I'd followed in his footsteps. Um, but because he, he died sort of very suddenly of lung cancer, there was lots of things unfinished and undone. So for the first sort of couple of years after he died, I sort of thought, well, I have to carry on on the path that he set for me in the mould that he shaped for me um, you know, and fulfil you know, the, the things that he wanted for himself that he didn't get time to do. And I was getting really unhappy with this and I was kind of feeling a bit weighed down. It's like I need to chase promotion. And he was a wing commander and I'm only a squadron leader. And it was getting I was getting quite unhappy for a while. I even thought about leaving the military. And then I realized 
I need to actually look at the labels that I'm carrying from him. And they were given with love because he wanted me to be the best I could be. He was a great yeah. parent in that respect. They were given with love rather than, you know, sort of being negative about, well, you know, you're just a woman or you're just a you know military officer. But I didn't want them. So I think it's being aware of the labels and being able to say, thanks, Dad. Thanks, Dad. Um, I'm going to take them off now with, you know, with love because you gave them to me with love. But I don't want them anymore. So I'm not I'm no longer the officer he wanted me to be. And I'm OK with that, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. yeah. And it's so interesting because it is that legacy that we carry, you know, that our parents or other guardians or someone that, you know, people that we respect put on us. Because, you know, they're proud of what we do and they want us to succeed and they want us to focus. And even, you know, even in the workplace, right, Leslie, the labels that we often carry in the workplace yes. that people have as, attached to us as who we are as individuals. And this is, I, I, I speak about this quite openly about not understanding my identity when I worked in, in corporate life. You know, I adjusted myself to such an extent that I didn't know who I was anymore. You know, who was I as a communications professional, who I who was I as a person? And I used to call myself a communications chameleon. So they say, like, oh, I can adjust to anyone. You know, I can change my personality and make and win people over all the time. Not recognizing that actually it was it was not fair on me by doing that. You know, I lost the sense of who I was. You know, I was adjusting myself to help other people be be more comfortable in my company, rather yes. than actually thinking, well, how do they? How do we do, you know, like, how do we have a balance in this? Like, we, I get it. We need to be accommodating. You know, we want to get those stories and we want to make sure that people trust us. You know, we want them to lean into some of the conversations we're having. And that is relationship building. And that is making sure that people understand why we're asking these questions. And they get us, right, to an extent. Yeah. But we shouldn't have to change our personality to do that. No. Uh, I yeah. There's something interesting in that the um, the old book, um, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, um, I was once given a well-meaning piece of advice by a military mentor when I was going through my sort of basic officer training. And he said, the best advice I can give you, Woods, because that's my surname, um, is you need to become a Babel fish. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I've never read a book, what's one of them? So I went and Googled it and thought, is this, an, is this offensive? Is he trying to be nice? <laughs> I went and Googled it and it's like that little tiny um, fish that goes in your ear and it whispers in the language that you understand. So it's a, it's a translator. It's a universal translator. So, or if you prefer sci-fi, it's kind of like Star Trek with the universal translator chips in there. Yeah. And so the idea is that I have to be this translator. So I hear someone else's story. I understand who the target audience is. And I am the sort of like the connecting part, if you think. Yeah. And I thought, OK, that's quite cool. But then, as you've just said over the years that hasn't actually stood me in good stead because you lose a part of yourself. I'm so busy translating for others that I lost a bit of who I was and yeah. I became unhappy. And then you ultimately look to change jobs if that happens, don't you? So you do. Yeah. Do you think you ever will? I mean, this is a big question live on TV show, isn't it? Like, do you, do you think you'll ever leave the kind of I, Royal Air Force and do something different? I mean, I've signed up. Um, I've signed up to 60. So um, I'm part time volunteer reserve. So I do reserve RAF service. I've been in 16 years. I signed up to 60 and I run it alongside my civilian job, which is in the Ministry of Defence as a civil servant. So I have two jobs. Um, they call me the hybrid. So I know you have labels. You're the chameleon. I'm the hybrid. Because <laughs> I am part military, part civilian. They have very different cultures and you sit in the office and they they speak, they literally speak a different language, even though we're all speaking English. Um, and again, they're looking to me to be the translator. Well, go see the hybrid because she'll translate. And I'm like, no, I don't want label. I don't want that label. Get rid of yeah. it. How um, do they actually reference you as hybrid? Is that how you're referenced? Yeah. Wow. But they mean it as a, you know, oh my yeah. God, Leslie can speak both sides. She's awesome. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. yeah, thanks for the compliment, but I'm not sure I want it. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting. so interesting. If anyone is watching us live, um, please do you know leave any questions or comments for Leslie as well. And if you're watching that replay, then also leave comments because I'm sure we'll get back to you as well. But um, once we switch off from from the live itself, so as you know, Leslie, every week uh, we ask our guests to leave a question for the next guest, and we've kind of stolen this idea. Well, we have not kind of we have stolen this idea from Stephen and the podcast that he does with the Diary of the CEO. Um, and last week, we had the wonderful John Porter from Engage Solutions, and he left you a question, which mm -hmm. is, um, which I love this question, is 
what is the best advice that you've ever been given? Thanks, John, for the question. Let me draw on that one briefly. Um, the best advice I've never been given that I've forged to myself, because I'm going to take the right to change that question, because my yeah. comms are, um, is you have to own your own story first. So you cannot look to share the stories of others and you'll be inauthentic and you will feel bad, badly about it if you do not own your own story first. So understanding who you are and, as we said, the labels that you might be carrying that you might wish to put down or you might wish to pick up, you know, where you've come from, why, your why, you know, going to Simon Sinek, referencing his work. Why do I do what I do? You know, I share the stories of the others that around me so that their voices can be heard. That's why I get out of bed in the morning. You know, I'm very clear on that, which is why I stayed in the military after my dad died, because I was doing it for my own reasons, not for his anymore. Yeah. So I, I would just say the best advice I can give you is understand yourself, own your own story before you would seek to share those of others. I love that. Own your story. And that is so true because I spoke about not having an identity when I worked in corporate and people would be really shocked when I used to speak up about it because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't wallflower and I, I was I was quite good at kind of, you know, building trust and building relationships. But and you wouldn't you probably never would have suspected that. But I didn't know my story. And that's, I think, that uncomfortableness just got too much for me, which yep. then knocked my confidence and self-esteem, which then I had to rebuild again in 2018, which led me to comms rebel, right? So people often ask me, why rebel? And yeah. I said, I think I've always been a little bit of a rebel, but I've always kept it hidden because that rebel's got such a negative connotation at attached to it <laughs> that I never wanted to frighten people from it. And I didn't want people to think that I was a troublemaker or a disruptor or someone who wasn't going to be play, you know, play nicely. Um, and what I realised is that actually a rebel is someone who wants to do things a bit differently, right? Yeah. And wants to, and is not afraid to be courageous and bold. And as soon as I started to lean into that a little bit more and found my story, yeah. it's, it's you do have this kind of unshakable confidence, right? So people can say what they like. You know, there are people watching who don't like like us or don't appreciate what we're saying or disagree. I'm okay with that, you know. And, and, and as I say, as a recovering people pleaser, I've got used to the fact that not everyone is going to like who we are, and it's yeah. okay to not be liked to be honest you know my one of my famous quotes that I often say is you can't be everyone's cup of tea otherwise you'd be a mug um yeah. and I'm okay with that and so owning your story and understanding who you are I think that's such great advice um what would be your question for our next guest we've got Claire next week what's your question for Claire okay so dear Claire um if you could leave one thing behind what would you like your legacy to be after you've gone? Oh, that is a good question. That is a good question. I really want to answer. Have you got an answer to that, Leslie? I want to hear your answer. <laughs> My legacy. Um, I am going to clear the runway for the next generation of comms officers that come after me um, so they don't have to go through some of the barriers that I've faced. Love it. Absolutely love that. And that's the thing. I, I shared a quote today on LinkedIn about our life. You know, it's a really, it's a, it, I think it's a quite famous quote, but I saw it on Instagram and it's about, you know, we, we live a life, um, we're kind of always chasing this life that we want to live. But when we get to the end of our life, it's like, what have we lived for? Yes. Um, and I just thought, God, it's such a powerful quote. And that is, you know, what is that legacy? And those who are listening, um, either replay or live, you know, it'd be great for you to kind of reflect on that question because I think that's such a brilliant question to think about and we should often remind ourselves of that because we get we get so caught up in the churn of everything um that we often forget the importance of it we're not here forever you know we're here for a very short amount of time in, in comparison to everything else so what is it that we're trying to do and what is it that we want to try and achieve and, and leave that legacy and I love that clearing the runway for the future generation so they don't have to put up with the barriers and, and there's some of the stuff that you've adversity that you've had to put up with love yes. it so if people wanted to connect with you and find out more about some of the work that you're involved in where is the best place for them to do that so i'm really happy to connect on linkedin you'll find me on there um but also i'm on instagram as the military media officer that's my handle love it and we'll share the links in in the comments as well for those of you who want to follow leslie and i highly recommend that you do because you share some brilliant insights and you've got such a unique job uh, working with some brilliant people who are doing some fantastic you know things um, and the fact hybrid as a new term that we've now learned <laughs> you can talk the language of two different civilians and the military so anyone who's got any questions or thoughts for Leslie then please do connect with her because I'm sure she'll appreciate uh, your connection um thank you everybody that time has flown as usual 
Uh, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to Leslie and our chat. If you have any um, suggestions for any future guests for Curious Global TV, then please do let us know. We go live every Friday at 11.30 on LinkedIn, on YouTube, and on Instagram now. So if you don't follow us on Instagram, then we're under the handle comms rebel. Please do follow us on there. We share lots of uh, behind the scenes stuff and, and top tips and techniques on there as well. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your time, your energy and the conversation today. I've loved it. I could have spoken to you for another half an hour or even the full day, to be honest. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. And um, please do chat on the comments and I'll get back to people. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you, everyone. See you next week.